Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Horizon. If you'd like to, would you please stand up and join us as we sing and as we worship together? Remember those walls that we caught sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Those giants we call death and grave They were like mountains that stood in our way But he came and he died and he rose Those giants are dead now Can we sing it out? This is our God This is our God, this is who he is He loves us And this is our God what he does, he saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Remember that fear that took our breath away. Faith so weak that we could barely. Every word, every whisper, oh yes you did. And now those altars in the wilderness tell the story of his faithfulness. Never once did he fail, and he never will. This is our God, this is who he is.
This morning, as I look around, we are once again, we have a packed house. How blessed we are to be joined by so many that we can uh, join our voices together and worship the Lord. And so if you don't mind, um, as people are kind of making their way in a little bit later on, uh, if they come to the end of the row, if you got some room, just squeeze in and um, make some room for them. So this morning, as we uh, surrender before the Lord, and I, my prayer is that we are continuing this morning to make room for him in our hearts. Jesus gives us a beautiful glimpse of God's heart and how he desires to have this intimate relationship with us, with his people. In our passage today in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut the door, pray to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Earlier this week, as I was reading through this passage and just kind of uh, preparing myself to worship through these songs and, and through this passage, I was just thinking, it's just so simply, but how amazing is it that the God of the entire universe, Almighty God, loves us enough that he desires to have an intimate relationship with you and I. And so this morning as we sing one more song together, maybe for some of us this is a prayer that we we sing to God, expressing how much we desire to, to trust in him more, that we want to see him move throughout our lives. We want to hear his voice and just simply we want to know him more. We want to have that connection, that relationship with our creator, with our father. Amen. So let's sing that together.
Father, thank you so much for this morning, for allowing us to gather so many to join our voices together to lift you up high. Father, I pray that you would just hear our hearts as we sing that to you, our desire to know you, our desire to touch you, to see your face, to see you move throughout our lives. Father, just to know you more. And I pray that you will speak into our hearts this morning as we study your word together. And it's in Jesus' name that we all pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, amen. Thanks for enjoying worshiping with us today, whether you're enjoying it here in the room or uh, the big group we have out in the atrium now or those enjoying uh, worship from the living room. It's just really incredible that we can worship and really make even the words of Scripture come to life. That song we just sang, In the Secret Place, is, is word for word, that phrase, what Jesus is going to talk about. He's going to tell us that there's certain things that can only be learned in the secret place to grow you spiritually. And this is a big, big week in Christendom. It's known as Palm Sunday. It's also known as the Triumphal Entry. It's a reminder that Jesus has stayed secret an awful lot of his time. Don't tell anybody. Don't talk about this miracle. But at the triumphal entry, Jesus marches in to the east gate of the city to proclaim himself as king. Now, they made a model of Jerusalem and show you what the east gate looks like. Jesus is going to come in through the east gate, and as he does that, you're going to see it comes right up to the temple. And just next to there will be the money changers where he'll clear out as he prepares for this last Passion Week. And all the worshipers who came up, literally hundreds of thousands coming into Jerusalem for Passover, they would sing psalms called the Psalms of Ascent. We did a whole series on this five years ago in equipping. And they would sing songs like, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were singing that every year. But this year as Jesus came in, riding on a donkey. Now John tells us that the disciples didn't figure out at that point until later that he was fulfilling exactly what Zechariah had predicted 300 years earlier, maybe 500, when he said, your Messiah will come, the sent one will be come, riding on a donkey. And as people saw him coming in through that east gate, they laid down palm branches and said, Hosanna, Hosanna, he is our king. He's going to deliver us from Rome. It was an incredible, joyous moment. And yet we're shocked to find out within the next week that same crowd, or at least many in the crowd, who said, Hosanna, Hosanna, will say, crucify him, crucify him. Because those palms often represent the way we receive Jesus as the king we want him to be. Deliver us from Rome! Not the king he presents himself to be. Which is so ironic because you think three years prior to this moment in history of triumphal entry, Jesus was preaching a sermon, a sermon on the mount, right? And he was saying, let me tell you, I'm a different kind of king and I'm bringing a different kind of kingdom. Remember last week we learned that one of the greatest things we can do is learn to live and love like our dad. And one of the most powerful ways you grow to be like dad is when you and I love our enemies and people who disagree with us. Well, that theme continues here. So here we are in the Sermon on the Mount, if you remember all the pieces. We began by learning that God, Jesus is a different kind of king with a different type of kingdom. He wants us to thirst and hunger after his righteousness. He wants us to know that it's going to fulfill the law, what he's going to talk about. It's going to address issues of your heart. But you're going to learn how to love the way he loves. He reigns on the just and the unjust. And now he's going to move into a section of three parts of which we'll be moving much slower than we did last week. But we're going to see a theme that runs through all three. Secret giving, secret praying, and secret fasting. So I want to show you a theme that runs through all three, but then we're going to cover each one on a particular week over the next month. So here we are here in verses 1 to 4. We'll touch on giving and then touch also a little bit on some of the details he gives about giving before we launch into the Lord's Prayer in about four or five weeks. Now hold that thought for a second. So it reminds me a little bit of uh, a buddy of mine. As I said, I don't go golfing very often, but uh, last year I got a chance to go golfing with a friend, and I hadn't golfed in about eight years. 
and I finally got one of the balls up on the, on the green. <laughs> and I was so proud of myself. And it was one of those shots that was so close to the hole, it was a gimme, which means for me, I'm definitely going to miss it. So I get up there to take my shot, you know, and there it is. I get all lined up, trying to remember everything I remember, and I give it a hit, and sure enough, missed. So I crawl over next to it, and it had gone a little past the hole on the other side. So I line up again, and sure enough, I give it my best shot. I try and aim, and miss. Miss, 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 miss. Finally, I sunk it in there, and I turned to my buddy Danny. I said, uh, you know why they don't go in, don't you? Because you're a terrible golfer. I said, they don't go in because they're afraid of the dark. <laughs> he started laughing. He said, I've never heard that before. I said, really? Trent, right before I went golfing with him, I went and Googled common phrases that golfers say. <laughs> and the one I heard was afraid of the dark. So he's going to start using it now, but no, apparently he never used it before. Oh, man. Jesus is going to tell us today that the secret to faith is not being afraid of the dark. That there is a way you grow spiritually through secret giving, where you go to a secret place where people can't see you and you're not afraid to give from a place where you don't give credit. You're not afraid, in fact, you long to go to that secret place in the dark with you and God to pray. And your spiritual disciplines like fasting, you wanna learn how to hunger after God, not so other people know you're doing it because you so want to know God. So we're gonna get three holes today. Secret giving, secret praying, and secret fasting. Like I said, we're focusing on the first two. And what we're going to find is that Jesus is going to show a way that motivates your giving and your praying. That it's not like the heathen who, who worship Zeus, he'll mention a couple times. And it's not like the religious way of praying and giving. It's a totally God's righteousness, my dad-focused, dad-motivated way of doing it. So start with hole number one. How do we engage in secret, not afraid of the dark, giving? But well, Jesus says, take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds, which certainly included more than just a financial giving, but in the context, it's primarily financial giving, before men. Don't do it before men. Don't be primarily motivated to be seen by other people by the way you give. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. No reward? Therefore, <laughs> that being true, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you. To which you're like, I wasn't tempted to. But in those days, you did. It was a way of drawing attention to yourself. <laughs> Chad's about to give. <laughs> did you see my check? <laughs> my name's on the brick. Dun, dun, dun. And so they literally, when it came time in synagogue to give, there was ways you announce. <laughs> And people gathered, oh, my, look how generous they are. Often somebody would cash in their, their, their tie to get lots of small coins. So it'd be like, clang, 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 clang. It's like at a casino, clang, clang. Oh, my goodness, look how spiritual they are. She says, when you are primarily motivated to give, to get attention from others, well, enjoy that because you're not getting reward from your father. He knows you didn't really do that to give to him. He did it to give to yourself, give yourself some praise. He goes on. He says, do not sound a trumpet like the hypocrites do. Now, Jesus uses this phrase over and over and over and over again in his teaching, and a lot in the sermon. The word hypocrite is the word actor. Don't be like an actor. You act like you're giving to God. You're really giving to yourself. You're an actor. And he says there's two types of actors. There's religious actors and rebellious actors. There's the people who give in the synagogue, the religious people who give. But there's also those who are heathen, who, who, set, who worship Zeus and Demeter and Hades and all that. They give in the streets. I'm not talking about either one of those. I'm talking about a brand new way of, of thinking about your finances, a brand new way of relating to your heavenly father. Don't do it so you get glory from men. Look at this giant sacrifice I'm bringing to Apollo. Look at this giant pile of cash I'm bringing to Yahweh. He said, that's not what I'm talking about at all. Assuredly, I say to you, if you do that, and if they do that, they have their reward. So if you went to a, a Greek play, right, you would see them wearing masks often, and they're pretending to be something they're not. That's what actors are, right? We're pretending to be something that we're not. 
And he's saying, when you pretend that you're given to dad, but you're really just wanting to get attention from others, you're playing the role of an actor. I was uh, researching for the sermon four or five months ago, and I was trying to see if there was any kind of golf stories that went with this. And I, I heard an amazing story. 1976, British Open, there was a guy named Maurice. They made a whole movie about it called The Phantom of the, of the Open. I didn't see it. It might be terrible, but the story is amazing. This guy had a dream of one day playing in the British Open. In 76, anyone could play. However, kind of common courtesy is you wouldn't go, not try out, you wouldn't go enter the competition unless your score was in the ballpark of what people did who won it. Well, Maurice knew that he could make a name for himself. So sure enough, he shows up, he signed up, he's in the Open. Bucket list moment. And no one knew his name, no one ever heard of him before, but by the end of the first hole, eyes are popping and jaws are dropping. They've never seen anything like this. He gets up to do that opening drive. The crowd, the competitors, the colleagues, after that first drive, it was obvious to them that this man had never played golf a day in his life. <laughs> and he hadn't, he had not played golf a day in his life. He literally had never played. He showed up at the British Open. He got the highest score ever. He becomes national news. The news comes to his mom's house. Hey, we, do you know your son uh, was in the British Open? Oh, I didn't know that. She knows nothing about golf. He got the highest score ever. I always knew he'd do something for himself. <laughs> he was acting. In fact, he spent the next couple of years dressing up in different outfits and changing his different aliases so he could keep competing in golf tournaments when he couldn't play golf. That's kind of this idea that Jesus is saying, you're pretending that you're generous. You're pretending that you're doing this for dad, but it all just acting. I don't want you to be like that. Instead, when you do your charitable deeds, don't even let like your left hand know what your right hand is doing, which obviously is an idiom, you know, but he's saying, that's how secret, that's how much I want you to go to the secret place, the, the not be afraid of the dark place. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That, your charitable deed, will be done in secret, like that song we sang. And when your father sees what's done in secret, will himself personally reward you openly. The God of the universe will see the quiet, don't bring attention to yourself, financial giving, and charitable deed, and what you did quietly, he will before all of the watching world of history reward you openly, not with temporal rewards, but with eternal rewards. So Jesus is saying, what would you rather have? A little temporal reward now, which kind of feels good, hey, or a lot of eternal reward later. See, giving doesn't just grow you. <laughs> Jesus is saying, giving is smart when you're giving to the Father. Because Dad's going to reward you for taking his resources and prioritizing his priorities. Then he'll reward you for doing it. What a deal. Now, I mentioned last year the story a couple times, but I want to pick up on the end of it. In case you don't know the story, my buddy Justin, he started coming to our church, drove by a couple times, not really a churchgoer, pulled in for our first exploring service for him, his first exploring service. He said, for the first time, what I heard and what I experienced from our church, I felt loved, I felt cared for, and it made sense. So he kept coming back. I got a chance to marry he and Stacy, um, performed the ceremony several years ago, and got to see him grow in incredible ways. And then, as I mentioned last year, he got ALS and slowly lost the ability to do anything except move his eyes. He asked me to baptize him, and I, I got to baptize him there and he was talking to me through the computer as I was baptizing him in his bed. And he passed away last year, and we had the most incredible hockey funeral we've ever had. But now we pick up on the story I haven't told you. He was so intentional before he died that he created a whole series of generous giving that he didn't even tell his wife fully about uh, initially. So about nine months ago, she came up to me after church. I said, hey, Stacy, how's it going? And she gave me permission to tell the story. She says, oh, things are going well. She, was, she says, I have something for you from Justin. Really? And she pulled out this check, and she said, Justin set up a series of giving after his death to a lot of different 
priorities, and one of them was the church. The church really helped him find faith and confidence facing ALS and his relationship with Jesus, and he wants you to do the same for other people. And man, I feel like I'm holding, I'm holding this holy check right here. And she told me, I said, any other ways he was intentional. And, and he knew his daughter loved Taylor Swift. So he had a couple of years in buying Taylor Swift uh, tickets for his daughter and, and, and different ages still coming up. She and they don't know everything he has planned because of the secret intentional giving he did. So here's Jesus' application to us. Will you and I practice secret giving primarily motivated that you want to do it to the Father? Now, I want to help people. You want to help people. Nothing wrong with helping people, but I'm primarily doing it to dad and then I'm saying, dad, I want to give to you. And now, dad, how do you want me to spend your money on your priorities? It's primarily done for the father. And Jesus says, nothing will grow you spiritually more than loving your enemies last week and learning how to give secretly where you don't get attention to yourself. I wrote down three questions I asked myself for the last couple months. Number one, is my giving afraid of the dark? I may not sound trumpets, but I am mentioning kind of where I serve. Am I mentioning in a conversation what I've done for the people? Or can I keep my giving in the dark, just between me and dad? Would I rather have a little now or a lot later? Am I primarily giving to my dad or am I giving to myself? And this is why the gospel is so unique. You see, if you don't know for sure you're going to heaven, then a lot of your giving and serving to other people is kind of padding your resume to hopefully get into heaven. And if you're just using people or serving other people to pad your resume, are you really serving them and giving to them or just giving to yourself? But once you understand the gospel, Jesus died for what you did wrong. Your good works are never going to be good enough. And Jesus gave you his resume. I now don't need to pad my resume. It wasn't that great anyway. I got Jesus' resume. So now I can finally give and serve and sacrifice with no ulterior motives except I want to be generous to you the way my dad was generous to me. Yeah, that doesn't mean that we don't think about our giving. It's God's money. We want to give it to God's places. And so we want to say, I want to spend God's money wisely. But the real goal is, God, I want want to grow spiritually through this discipline. So sometimes people say, well, one of God's priorities is the church, and certainly the bride of of Christ is the church, and I give to Horizon like Justin did. And so it's okay to ask questions. In fact, we're always available at the hearth room to ask questions. But if you ever wonder, like, what does Horizon do? How do we prioritize? Let me show you. You can go to our website, horizoncc.com. You can click on give. When you click on that, you page down, and there's always our budget. So this was our operating budget last year, 3.8 million. This year it's 4.0. And you'll see the priorities that we give to. We're trying to prioritize the king's priorities. You know, weekend services. That's our values of challenging Bible teaching, culturally relevant. We want to make the Bible come alive. Children and student ministries, 15%. It's one of our values, family. God believes in families. How do we equip parents to, to equip kids? And how do we create experiences to, to anchor into our children and students? We have 95 junior hires coming right now to our service. That's like a small church. Adult ministries, how do we connect people? Our value of multiplication and transform lives. IT and communication with all the ways we're able to connect now, not just through what happens in the room, but what's happening uh, in living rooms all over the country right now for those who are are experiencing and enjoying the service that way. Our facility is only 19% because I've told the story before, but God's faithfulness is so amazing that we got in this facility and people gave four-year pledges, hundreds of families. Some came later and gave two-year pledges. Some came later and gave one-year pledges. So we had money in the bank when the 2008 financial crisis hit. Because of that, we were able to negotiate and build this place for pennies on the dollar, and we built it 100% debt-free, which means for a church our size to only have 19% going to facilities is another reminder of God's faithfulness to us. And then lastly, administration, the infrastructure that makes it all work. We're just so honored and humbled by how God has allowed us to be part of his work, and Church kind of experts will say, if you're growing at 3%, you're breaking even because of people who leave. Let me show you just the ways in which God has been drawing people to himself. Every week as staff, we hear people say, my first time here, we've been coming for two weeks, we've come for six weeks. As you see in this room, you know, it's packed. We've got people out in the atrium. We've grown from 22% uh, from the uh, 2022 to 2023. We're up 20% this year. And those are individual lives of people who are being transformed by God in fresh ways. 
In fact, even when you look at our giving base, you know, the families who are saying, hey, I not only attend here, but I want to give financially here. I want to grow in the grace of giving. Uh, that's up in people serving and giving. We have 25 full-time staff here, but it takes about 300 volunteers every week to kind of run the place. Children's programs, individual Bible study leaders, cutting out crafts, running cameras. And so volunteers have always been the heart of horizon. And people saying, I want to give my charitable deeds. I want to, somebody create a facility for me. Somebody uh, welcomed me when I came two years ago or eight weeks ago. How can I do the same? And with that, you know, the financial givers at our church, we have 11% more families who are saying, man, I want to invest here. I'm so excited about what God is doing. I want to be part of that. Now, you know, a lot of churches will have a, a big thermostat, not thermostat, a big thermometer, and they'll talk about the expenses and, and the money all the time. And, and that's fine. A lot of people do that. Nothing wrong with that. We kind of take a different approach, which is when the Bible talks about money, we talk about money. When it doesn't, it's not that it's not important. It's not that we don't need the money. It's that you don't feel like you're talking about it all the time from the stage. When Jesus says, hey, we've got to grow in this area, we'll talk about that. And we don't have, like, you know, every board has somebody's name on it or every brick has somebody's name on it. We haven't taken that approach either. We've had more of a secret, don't be afraid of the dark approach to giving. And yet, let me tell you a little, a little inside baseball here, almost everybody's name is on the building. But in a secret way. And we give different times, during different seasons of, of our church history to do that. Let me just show you a couple, in case you don't know. When we uh, were just started finishing up the facility, we were building, so this is, obviously, it's, the walls are not covered yet. So we invited the entire church who was attending at that time to come. And as they came in the building, they were able to sign the walls with their names. But more than their names, with scriptures. God, bless your house. God, make this a place you grow people. Grow me through this. Teach me. Reach my friends. Specific people we were praying for, family members, friends to come to the church. We didn't know if we could even fill a third of one room in one service when we got into this building. I mean, that's the step of faith we were taking. And yet, I hadn't seen these pictures in years. To see all the scriptures, all the prayers, all the generous outpouring of emotion and giving that went into this, it just reminded me of how our entire building is covered in prayer and bathed in prayer. We had another uh, opportunity called Service on the Green where we had these big balloons. That's our current baptism right there. We pray that that big piece of green grass would one day be a place people's lives were transformed. We've literally had hundreds of people baptized underneath that balloon since then. That's my daughter and my son right there. Back in the, and we were praying for that spot. We put butterflies all over the property to say, God, make this a place that people change. You might say, well, Chad, I've heard this story. It's for other people. Well, we're going to have another opportunity in the next month for the next generation. As part of our worship service, we're going to get an opportunity to take seeds, and we're going to go out and plant Flowers that come up every year to remind us how God wants to grow us and grow the next generation. Weather permitting, we'll see which day it ends up, but sometime next month will be a next opportunity for us to do that. If you've ever been up to our church office, you'll see that picture of Jesus. You may have seen it before, maybe you don't come up to the offices. I had him take it down. It hasn't been taken down in like 12 years. This painting was done at the last service that we did at Cincinnati Country Day School. This was a painting of Jesus done as part of our Christmas Eve service at the last service before we entered this building. I remember because it starts off with the town of Bethlehem over here. This is actually a manger. This is Mary leaning over the manger, Joseph leaning over the manger, and it slowly transformed into Jesus. And we remember how powerful that service was. We said, God, thank you. We prayed for years for a new facility. But then we let everybody who was part of that stage of the church sign the back of it. So, if you've ever seen this picture, it was so much fun this week to go through and just see so many of you who've been giving and serving and leading Bible studies and working in children's ministry for literally 10, 20 years. I got to find, apparently, uh, my son circled all my family, so it was easy to find. <laughs> and man, I just had such an incredible moment of, of gratitude and humility. And so in one sense, you probably wouldn't even know people's names are on the building because it's just a reminder how we secretly gave and secretly served over time to say, God, we want Jesus to be the focus. We want people to know about you. So as you think about your own giving, ways you want to grow spiritually, maybe God would prompt you to say, man, 
I want to start engaging in secret giving and see how God might grow me. I hope one of the ways he does that is by giving to one of his priorities, the church at Horizon. Because it's so much fun to see what God's doing and to know I get to be part of that. Secretly giving primarily to the Father. Then he moves on to prayer. He says, I want you to have secret, not afraid of the dark praying. Same words, same phrases. When you pray, you should not be like the hypocrites. There it is again. For they love to pray standing in synagogues, religious prayer, or on the corners of the street, heathen prayer, we'll get to in a second, that they may be seen by men. Surely I say to you, they've got the reward. Look at how they pray. Oh, Father, we thanketh thou for thou timeth that you have brought us into my life. Wow, that guy knows how to pray. I was like, oh, that's fine. You can impress other people. You're not talking to my dad. Assuredly, I say to you, when you talk like that to bring attention to yourself, you, you got your reward. Okay. Good luck. People, people think you're a great prayer. But I say to you, they have the reward. But you, when you pray, go into the room. Shut the door. Pray to your father who's in the secret place. And your father who sees what's in secret, get this will reward you openly. God's going to reward me for just talking to him in private? What kind of a deal is this? I mean, God gives you his resources, and then when you take his resources and give it to his priorities, he rewards you for it. And when you really want to get to know God and you pray to God, he rewards you from wanting to get to know him. That's why this is the good news, the gospel. He goes on. When you pray... Do not use vain repetitions like the heathen do. So I said he just contrasted the religious praying, and now he's going to contrast it with the secular praying, the heathen, those who worship Zeus and Demeter and, and the Greeks and Romans. So what does it mean to use vain repetitions like the heathen do? He says, well, get, they think they will be heard for their many words. But don't be like them. Now, why did they think that? Well, if you've read uh, the Homer's Iliad or the Odyssey, it's kind of, this one's a powerful story about the Trojan Wars, but there's this big, long, laborious prayers in the middle. And Homer had taught the Greeks and Romans, if you want to pray, a few things you need to know. Number one, the gods are busy, and they don't care much about you. So you don't know if they're going to be looking down, so make them long prayers so you can catch their attention span. Number two, you've got to address them properly. So long, laborious intros. Dear Zeus, who's on Mount Olympus, who did that thing three years ago, who really loves that garden over there, you almost got to get the address right. So big, long, laborious things to make sure that you get the right God, get the right address. Then, gods don't do anything for nothing. So before you ask for anything, long reminders of what you're going to offer. God, I got this brand new cow, and he hasn't been milked, and he's very valuable, but I'm willing to give it to you. Last time I gave you a pig, a pig and, and you love that because you did this for me, and you get long, laborious reminder of God, I scratched your back, now maybe you'll scratch mine. Then, after that, if they're watching and if they care and if they're having a good day, then maybe if you, if, you, if you talked long enough and prayed long enough, then you say, by the way, could you help me with my child? Could you help me with my field? So Jesus is saying, you don't need to pray like the heathen do. You have a heavenly father who does care about you. He is listening. He does want to spend time. You don't need to get his address right. He's the God who made the heavens and the earth. You don't have to scratch his back and he scratch yours. He wants to know you. And many scholars have wondered, like, where does Jesus get the template for the Sermon on the Mount? Now, they don't know this for sure. And we'll talk more about this in a few weeks. But here's a few scholars think that Jesus may have gotten the Sermon on the Mount as a reference point to the prayer of Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles. I'll read it back to back. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Jehoshaphat. O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And in your hand is there not power and might, so that no one is able to stand against you? God, you didn't just stay in heaven. You came down here and drove out the inhabitants of the land. Your, your kingdom was on earth before your people Israel. And then you gave us what we needed. You gave it to the descendants of, of Abraham, your friend forever. God, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts 
And in Deuteronomy, it said when you forgot God, rebelled against God, there'd be pestilence and judgment and bad things. But you could then repent of those things and call upon God, and he would actually hear you and forgive you. And that's what Jehoshaphat's referencing here. He says, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine for disobeying God, we will stand before this temple in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save us. That's how you deal forgiveness. Then in the Old Testament, like, so go judge all my enemies. And Jesus seems to flip this and say, Father, forgive me my debts, but also forgive my debtors and my enemies. Jehoshaphat, for we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Jesus, deliver us from evil. Lead us not to temptation, deliver us from evil. For yours, our eyes are on you, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those countries that they heard that the Lord had done. So I don't know for sure. But it's interesting that these themes that Jesus references have been themes forever. God is king. God has a kingdom. Kingdom wants to flow through me and in me. When I fall short, I can come to him in prayer and say, God, I need forgiveness. I blew it again. I lost my temper again. I didn't live out the way I was supposed to live it out. And God said, don't pretend like the hypocrites do. Just talk to your dad. Share your tears. Share your thanks. Share your blessings. And invite him into a deeper relationship. In the same way that secret giving can grow you in a way that nothing else can, secret praying can grow you in a way that no one, nothing else can. A pastor one time said to me, he said, you know what, if you only pray at meals in front of people as part of a habit, that's fine. But you're really going to know your intimacy with God by measuring your secret prayer life when it's just you and God. How are you in your secret praying? I think what he's saying is if prayer is primary, if giving is done primarily to the Father, prayer is primarily done with the Father. It's Dad and I talking about our life. Dad and I talking about what's going on. Dad and I talking about what I'm struggling with. I was talking to a guy at our church who was coming years ago to a series we did called Habits. And I totally forgot about the series. But part of the series is we talked about habits you could put into your life. And then we had uh, every week things you could do. Prayers you could do, little one-sentence prayers, little scriptures you could read. He said, yeah, I got to tell you, that series you guys did years ago so changed my life. I'm like, which series? He said, Habits. I'm like, oh, I kind of remember that. I said, what was big about it? He goes, I learned that I could just talk to God. I thought I had to pray in religious terms or a big formula. I realized I could just talk in slang. Just tell God where I was going on, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And man, I used that habits guide and I prayed and I feel so much closer to God. Secret praying. Now, like I said, we're going to touch a lot more on, on prayer in a few weeks and we're going to touch a lot more on fasting a few weeks after that. But let me just show you this theme that shows up again in fasting just to show you what runs through the whole thing. Secret, not afraid of the dark fasting. When you fast, don't be like the hypocrites. There it is again. You're just doing it to appear before men. You're getting your reward from them. I want you to fast before your father. And fasting simply means to go without food for a time. Could be a meal, could be two meals, could be a couple days. And when your body is hungering, you feel your stomach growl, it's kind of like a reminder of your body to say, I want to hunger after God the way I'm currently hungering after that Skyline chili. Whew. I don't think I love God as much as I love Skyline. I know my stomach doesn't love God. You know, so, so you really were using your body as a mechanism to remind you to spiritually hunger for God. That's what fasting's about. He says, and when you fast, don't kind of make a big deal so people are like, oh my goodness, you look bad. I'm fasting for the Lord. I want you to kind of do it in secret so people don't know. And your father who sees what's in secret will reward you openly. And so, you know, for the last 20 years of the church, one of our habits has been that the leadership tries to go away as often as we can. Often it's been once a year, and we spend a couple days in prayer and fasting about the direction of the church, where we're headed, where we're going, big moments. Should we build a building in 2008? Time to maybe think about another service. Uh, times when we said, hey, we should put in video equipment, and sure enough, God led, and, and right in the middle of that, 
the combination of God's leading through prayer and fasting to the leadership and the financial giving, we were able to put in cameras and they were literally installed two months before COVID hit. It just continues to show God's timing, God's faithfulness, and it doesn't mean we always get it right, but we're trying as best we can to seek after God and say, God, we want your will to be done at this little spot of earth that we call Horizon and through every life and every family that's changed because of it. So if last week we learned that we live and love like dad, I think his main application for us is when you pray primarily to the Father and when you give primarily to the Father and when you fast primarily for more of the Father in your life, then you're going to learn how to give to dad and give like dad. I'm going to give to my dad. Dad, I want to give my prayers to you. I want to give my finances to you. I want to give my spiritual disciplines to you. But also, God, I want to give like you. I want to be as generous as you are with my money, with my time, with my kindness, with my forgiveness. Give to dad. And if you've been giving for a while, are you giving like dad? What does it look like to be more generous? You see, Jesus wasn't just generous when they laid down those palm branches. Hosanna, Hosanna! He was generous when those same fists said, crucify him, give us Barabbas. And in that moment, Jesus was equally generous with his love, with his forgiveness. And you've never seen anything more generous than the God of the universe who came down to our level to enter into our pain to be kicked in the teeth by us to still say, I'm dying for them. The generous outpouring of love and forgiveness and joy. And that becomes the motivator to give. Not guilt, not getting to heaven, but man, I want to give to my dad and I want to give like my dad. So as you leave today, you're going to be given a, a piece of palm. Maybe you want to set that in, in your house, set it around the kitchen table, something to remind you this week. Is God king of my life? And is his kingship affecting my giving, my praying, and my disciplines? Am I, am I receiving him as the king I want him to be? Or the king he's presented himself to be? Father, teach us all how to give to dad and like dad. Let's pray. Father, Thank you for another challenging teaching by you that just exposes for me just how often I do things so I have a great story to tell, so I can share it with somebody else, not just so you and I could have a private moment together. Grow us all in the grace of giving. Grow us all in the intimacy of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as you leave, grab a palm branch. Also, if you want to celebrate the uh, Good Friday service with us, it's online only. We just got a chance to watch it. We shot, shot it all last week. Uh, incredible time of communion and worship and meditation. Uh, you can take communion elements with you if you don't have ones, or you can just have your own wine and bread at your own home. Uh, it goes live on Friday if you want to watch that online. Lastly, Easter, we have tickets still available for you and your family. We do have more room at the 1215 service. So if you have some flexibility in your schedule, we'd love for you to prioritize that one. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next week.